Hi, my name is Max Gotzler and I'm your host for The Flow Great Show, where I'm interviewing top performers and health experts about topics such as biohacking, buttered coffee, cricket flour, powerlifting, and many other health-related topics in order to enhance performance. Today, I have a very innovative entrepreneur and record-holding powerlifter on the show. His name is Gabby Lewis, and he founded the company ExoProtein. Now, Exo makes protein bars, but made out of cricket flour. This might sound disgusting to the one or the other, however, they actually are quite tasty. Now, make sure you stay tuned until the end of the episode, because Gabby is not only talking about cricket bars, but also how he convinced Tim Ferriss himself to be on his advisory board. Well, Gabby, uh, welcome to the Flowgrade Show, our podcast here in Germany and uh, Europe, I would say, about biohacking and uh, health-related topics and self-optimization. And uh, very happy to have you in the show. How are you doing today? Very well. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And you're over in New York right now. We are actually here in rainy Berlin in late July. I don't know. The weather is kind of upset here. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm in New York. It is extremely hot. Very, very sweaty day here in New York City. That's one thing about New York that uh, I don't understand. Like the weather is never really good somehow, right? <laughs> it's too hot. It's too cold. It's, it's never just right. I mean, I, I studied in Boston, so at least the summers in Boston were quite nice, but in New York, uh, yeah. Hey, anyways, let's jump right into it, and uh, maybe uh, for our listeners, because I already know quite a bit about you, but they don't probably, and how about you just tell us really quick uh, what you do and who you are? Sure. My name is Gabby Lewis. I grew up in Scotland, came to the US six years ago to study at Brown University, where I studied philosophy and mathematical economics. I spent a little bit of time at a hedge fund after that, and then I started a company called EXO. And EXO is a food startup based here in New York City. And our mission is to introduce insects as an alternative protein source. That's actually uh, really interesting. I ordered, I think, my first protein bars from you guys last year. Mm -hmm. And then I had them lying around at home for a while. And my dad was like, uh, I heard you, you ordered these disgusting protein bars with crazy flour. <laughs> and he said, yeah. And so where, where are they, by the way? And I said, they're lying around uh, at, back home. And he's like, oh, this, this, this case with the protein bars, I ate all of them. They were very. <laughs> I said, this was, wow! Wow! This was the there you go. Flour. And he said, oh, they were actually pretty good. Yeah, you'd never know. And uh, because they don't taste like you would assume, right? I mean, well, yeah, everyone has this idea of what they think crickets will taste like, and it's hilarious because everyone tries it and they say, "Oh, this doesn't taste like crickets," as if they know what crickets taste like. And of course, they've they've never tried crickets; they don't even know what that would be. But you're right in that people have relatively low expectations. And so whenever they try them and they are delicious, everyone's always blown away. Yes, uh, I have to say that, yeah, you, you did a really good job with the taste. And uh, I think it, it, you had quite an interesting journey because I've, I've heard the story before. But since it's such a good story, what, uh, could you tell uh, about the time that your co-founder, Greg, uh, approached you first with, with the idea of making that? Yeah, of course. So during my senior year of college, I was obsessed with fitness and nutrition. I was doing CrossFit obsessively. I was actually competing in powerlifting and broke the New England deadlift record at the time for my weight category. How much did you, did you deadlift? I deadlifted 505 at a body weight of 160. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Um, but that's a so I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I was very into that world, but was frustrated by the lack of good, good food options for a, a busy college student who wanted to eat well and was working out hard. And, you know, I'd go into Whole Foods or various health food stores and there'd be these just walls of protein bars, but they're all terrible. So either they're just candy bars and they pretend to be health food, but they're full of sugar or the few that are good for you taste like cardboard. And so there was nothing 
really on the market as far as snack bars go. They both tasted great and was truly healthy. And so during my senior year of college, I decided to try and fix that and to make my own. So I was making these protein bars in my dorm room using almond butter and raw cacao and dates and some whey protein isolate, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. But really couldn't find that perfect protein source. So whey protein was giving me slightly upset stomach. Um, I don't do very well with dairy. And, you know, it's hard to get a lot of hemp protein for a decent price. Soy protein has a lot of drawbacks to it, obviously. And so there was no perfect protein source for these bars I was making. And my roommate at the time, Greg, went to a conference at MIT where they were talking about climate change. And, you know, they're talking about how quickly the world population is growing and how inefficient our food system is and how much water it takes to get a pound of steak, for example. And someone at this conference suggested if we could start eating insects for a protein source instead of all of the conventional livestock we eat, we could have tremendous global impact because we'd reduce the feed and the water in the space required to give us protein, essentially. And so Greg basically saw me looking for the perfect protein source. He'd been at this conference where someone said that bugs were the perfect protein source. And so he suggested that I try and incorporate that into my protein bars that I was making. And, you know, like your dad, who you mentioned, who heard the idea and thought it was crazy, when I heard this idea for the first time, I thought it was ridiculous, and I didn't understand why someone would want to eat bugs. But then I started reading more and more about it, and I learned not only are insects exceptionally sustainable and resource efficient to raise, but they're also very, very good for you. So they're a complete protein with all the essential amino acids, they're very high in omega-3s, iron, calcium, all different micronutrients. And so it really makes a ton of sense from a nutritional perspective. And as a next step, we ordered 2,000 live crickets to our dorm room on campus, basically. And we learned that the way many cultures around the world consume insects is by drying them out in the sun and essentially grinding them up in a kind of mm -hmm. like pestle and mortar and we did a similar version of that by roasting these crickets that arrived live in shoe boxes in our dorm room <laughs> we roasted them in the oven which removed the moisture and then we threw them into my my blender did, did we you made freeze a, them before actually we did oh yeah, yeah sorry we freeze them first which um essentially puts them to sleep slows down their nervous systems their metabolism so and eventually smooth, eventually yeah. kills them a very smooth gentle death <laughs> um, it, it's the best way a cricket can go, I yeah. think. So after killing them ethically, we then roasted them and ground them up into what was essentially a cricket protein powder. And I put that into my bars in place of the whey protein, and it was delicious. And so we basically made a batch of 50 bars. We took them to a CrossFit gym, got some feedback. Everyone there loved it. Next day, we took the rest to a farmer's market. Again, everyone loved the idea, loved the product. And so when we graduated three months later, um, we decided to see if we could turn it into a business. How does the, the amino acid profile of uh, your protein bars compare to, let's say, whey protein isolates, hemp protein, and, and other sure. sources? Sure. So the amino, the amino acid breakdown of cricket protein is most comparable to egg white protein, which is typically considered the gold standard for amino acids. So it's a complete protein um, with all the aminos you need. And then not only is it a good quality bioavailable protein, it's also higher in micronutrients than most protein powders. So if you're eating whey or soy or egg white, you're pretty much just getting protein. With the cricket protein we use, you're also getting tons of micronutrients. So gram for gram, you're getting more calcium than milk. You're getting more iron than spinach. You're getting more omega-3s than grass-fed beef. So it's really a, a true superfood as much as I hate that word. <laughs> yeah, it is an overused word a little bit. <laughs> um, however, and I'm sure you heard that before, your bars have 10 grams of protein. And yep. a lot of people think that they need a lot more, let's say, when they work out. 
Yeah. Is that something uh, also like how many bars actually do you have w when you work out after or before? Yeah. So I usually have half a bar before I work out and a full bar after I work out. Okay. Um, and so that's, I'm getting 15 grams around my workouts. And like I said, it's a top quality protein and I've been getting get great results. So everyone that's been eating them has been getting great results. Um, and it's also a fantastic snack and meal replacement. So if, you, if your only goal is just get as much protein as possible, there are other ways to do that. But if you want a balanced, healthy snack, pre-workout, post-workout, between meals, then this offers a lot more than just your 30 grams of isolated protein. Would there be a way to add more protein? Or what are the reasons that you, yeah. that you don't offer, let's say, bars with a higher content? Sure. So... It's all about trade-offs. Now, we could use um, binders that you can't pronounce or brown rice syrup and cram tons of protein in there, and the bar would be a lot chewier than it is currently. It would have a longer list of ingredients, many of which you won't be able to pronounce, but you, you take that box of higher protein, um, and it wouldn't taste as good. So for us, we you know every, every bar company has to decide what it wants, and so... You cannot make a bar that's the most delicious, the highest protein, the lowest sugar, the most natural ingredients. You can't have it all. And so we decided to create a delicious bar that has ingredients you know and you can pronounce that are real food ingredients that you buy in the store. And it's got a decent amount of protein. It's not the highest protein, but it's got enough. And it ticks the other boxes. And that's what we care about. Yeah, and uh, speaking of delicious, uh, I know uh, actually, uh, as a matter of fact, that you included a person that is uh, there's probably not there are not that many people that are better in uh, preparing something delicious than one of your uh, mentors I would say and I actually got hooked on that Netflix series uh, chef's table I don't know if you heard about that oh yeah 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 I've seen it it's great and uh, it just made me think of that because you have a Michelin star chef on board right We do, yeah. We have our three Michelin star chef on board. Wow. So his name is Kyle Connaughton, and he was the head chef of R&D at a restaurant called The Fat Duck in England, which, while he was there, was ranked the number one restaurant in the world. So he's, he's a serious chef, and the, bar, the bars taste like they were made by a serious chef. What, what, what's the story behind that? How, how do you get in touch with a person like that? It's hard. So basically, through a friend of a friend of a friend, we got his email address. And at the time, he was actually teaching a college course in food science. And so we sent him this long email telling him that we'd love for him to introduce us to one of his students to help us with this project. And so he wrote back, said, sure, like, seems like a great project for one of my students. Let's grab coffee quickly so I can understand what you need. And then I'll introduce you to someone. And so we took him out for coffee in New York. And we got on so well. And he loved the idea so much. He asked if he could take on the project himself. And so that was right after we graduated college. So we really just had an idea at that stage. And he took a chance on us. He worked for, for no pay initially. And just because he loved the idea. And we got on so well. And he's been a really key part of our team ever since. So he's developed... The initial flavors, he's developing more flavors currently and also more products beyond just bars. Wow. Has he actually cooked for you guys as well? He has, and it's exceptional, as you might imagine. <laughs> what what do you cook for you? What did he cook for us? He's made all kinds of things for us. He okay. invited us he invited us over for a barbecue one evening, and you know, we were just expecting burgers on the grill, but of course that wasn't what he what he had in mind, so he It was on a rooftop and he made us this like cedar plank wild salmon with a variety of different sauces he'd made from scratch. Wow. And, and that was just, you know, a casual Monday night's dinner for him. It wasn't even, he wasn't trying to impress. It was just an easy meal he threw together, but it was one of the best barbecues I've ever had. Wow. That really sounds like it, that could be on chef's table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not bad. And actually... Uh, I heard that not only you convinced uh, a three Michelin star chef, but also one of, I'd say, 
the influencers of our industry, uh, one of the big ones, uh, Tim Ferriss, to to be on board. Yeah. And uh, I, I know actually I have a couple of friends in San Francisco and they're close, but he's probably the number one most difficult person to reach in the world. <laughs> how, yeah. did, how did you manage to do that? Yeah, it wasn't easy. You know, he'd been, in terms of the people I really wanted to get involved with this business from the beginning, he'd been, he'd been up there, obviously, since the start. And so I knew I really wanted to reach him and tried through various ways which failed. And then eventually, uh, an advisor of ours named Jeffrey Zorowski, who is the CEO of a bunch of restaurants here in New York, he, he had met him. And so he put us in touch via email and we took it from there and eventually became very involved. And now he's an investor and an advisor. How is he in, in, in person? Is he as like experimentative as, as he comes across in, in all his books and, and works? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's fantastic. I remember he, we met him at one of, his, one of his houses and first thing in the morning he was, you know, concocting his like crazy tea ritual of all these superfood ingredients. And he definitely, definitely lives the life that he, he talks about, which, which is rare, you know what I mean? It's you have a lot of a lot of people who offer advice but don't necessarily follow that advice. But he's certainly not like them. That's what I think. Really, in the end, uh, ensures long-term success is this uh, authenticity that he mm -hmm. has. And actually, you have that too because when I did my research now, also for the podcast, you know, I came across that YouTube video where you were actually deadlifting. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that, that's cool. Uh, yeah. you know, it's not only a story. It's actually people live up to the story when you hear yeah. uh, the guy. Really that's, a, that's a scary video. I, I almost hurt myself there. I don't right, know if you saw my, my, leg was, my leg was shaking quite, quite a lot. Wow. Yeah. No, that's a lot of weight. I, I forget. I mean, I was on the Boston University basketball team and we did a lot of cleans. And I was, I think, I was the number one guy in cleans and I got up to 180. <laughs> I think that was it. Wow. Right. So that, that was not bad, but still. No, that's serious. You probably, you probably beat me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, talking a little more about, about the crickets, because I'm also personally interested in how that evolves, because we are building up a business right now. And yeah. I, I'm sure that a lot has happened ever since you started you know, blending some crickets in, in your home blender to what you're doing right now. So how has the production and the farming uh, evolved and changed? Are you actually sure. partnering? Do you have your own farms or how does that work? Sure. So, you know, when I first started this company, I thought we'd vertically integrate everything. And so we'd own our own farms, we'd own the processing, we'd make our own bars, we'd do everything ourselves. And what, what every entrepreneur realizes, I think, is you just can't do everything, right? Um, or if you do, then everything will be not very good. So the best thing to do is to focus on one thing and do it well and have other people do everything else. So on the farming side, rather than farming the crickets ourselves, we have very close partnerships with a handful of different cricket farms. And, you know, we work with them very closely on the feed and the quality and the regulations and... You know, the quality control is as if it was our farm because we are the largest purchaser from these farms, but we're not physically there and we don't own the farm. So it's not as distracting as if it was our own. On the, on the processing side, it's somewhat similar. We've developed close partners who we work with alongside the farms. And so we'll send the crickets to these partners. They'll process the crickets into the protein powder and then send it to our co-manufacturer which receives all of the ingredients and then turns them into, into the bars, sends them off to our warehouse. Okay, wow. Interesting how that always... Uh, how, how long did that take you to get where you are right now, actually? Um, you know, so from... So we did the Kickstarter campaign in the summer of 2013, but we didn't actually make the product the first time until March of 2014. So those seven months was basically how long it took us to set up the entire supply chain and manufacturing, um, which, which is quite a long time. And that's because there was no infrastructure for sustainable cricket farms. 
here in the US. So we had to work with people to set it up from scratch, find all the partners I just described. And then, like I said, we made the product for the first time just over a year ago. Do you see that market growing? Actually, I was in San Francisco for a wedding, I think a month ago, and then I came across this bakery and they marketed their products with, uh, well, using cricket flour. I forgot the name, but there's one bakery in San Francisco that does that now, apparently. Yeah, yeah. And so it seems like it's a thing. You made it a thing, maybe. I, I hope we. I hope we're making it a thing. I mean, you know, when we started, there were maybe one or two others who had a similar idea who were kind of working on things. And now there are dozens of companies working on insect protein here in the U.S. And there's dozens more elsewhere. So it's definitely. It's definitely becoming a thing and we're all working together to educate the public and I think it's only going to work when there are lots of companies doing it, right? So if there's just one company selling cricket protein, that company seems like a, like a weird company doing this weird thing. As soon as there's 10 companies doing it, it adds legitimacy and it seems, it seems more serious and people trust the idea. So I think it's important that there are a group of us now. Yeah, no, I think it's... Uh... It's a good development. We also here in Germany, we notice that we're always a little lagging behind in terms of mm -hmm. accepting new trends and, and things. Paleo, for example, is just right now, it's, it's a really hitting Germany uh, and CrossFit as, as well. I mean, over the last mm -hmm. year, I think there's several CrossFit gyms that popped up all over Berlin. Wow. And so, yeah, this, this is an interesting trend. And actually, we are excited now because in, in, in our flow grade shop we're gonna offer exo protein bars and fantastic they they arrive here we, we just made the first wholesale order now and well i've done it in the past but this was just for my my dad's <laughs> pleasure <laughs> to be at the end. He, he ate really pretty much all of them and there were a lot there were 72 bars i think wow uh, and uh, actually, one thing I want to dig in, because I just look at it, uh, is uh, I heard there's a really interesting discussion going on that cricket protein bars can be considered vegan or even vegetarian for ethical reasons. And at first, when you hear that, you think, this is ridiculous. What is your take on that? Well, it's, it's funny, because every vegan or vegetarian asks us if the bars are vegan or vegetarian. <laughs> and... You know, of course they're not. Just because crickets are small animals doesn't mean they're not animals, right? Um, so they're not technically vegan or vegetarian. But we do find that a lot of vegans and vegetarians eat them. And like you mentioned, it depends on their reason for being a vegan or vegetarian. If they're vegan for environmental reasons, because they don't like the negative impact of raising cows on the environment, then cricket protein is a fantastic alternative. They're vegan for ethical reasons because they don't want to be killing animals with well-developed nervous systems that can feel pain. Then again, crickets might be a good alternative because there's some research suggesting that insects don't have a well-developed nervous system and don't feel pain as we understand pain, at least. So there are good reasons why vegans or vegetarians might want to eat our bars, even though they're not strictly vegan or vegetarian. I mean, they also contain honey, which isn't vegan either. Mm. So, oh, okay, yeah, sure. The, uh, I always forget that it's not only about killing animals; it's anything that animal right. produce. Right. Uh, but that actually makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah, it's a sustainable resource. Do do other uh, insects actually qualify as well? Yeah, I mean, there are about 1,600 species of edible insects, and they're all high in protein, healthy fats, all very good for you. The reason we chose crickets was because, A, they're pretty easy to farm, B, they're amongst the healthiest in terms of protein content to other macronutrients, and then C, we think they have the lowest psychological hurdle. So... The, the highest protein insect is actually the dung beetle. But for obvious yeah. reasons, the dung beetle is a little harder to sell, yes. especially in chocolate protein bars. So we chose crickets as an easier introduction. I see. Yeah, it makes sense. Or a spider, I'd say, also is, uh, for, for right. a lot of people could be a big hurdle <laughs> to put that in your mouth. 
Switching gears a little bit, um, since you are a record-holding power lifter, I'd be also interested in your in your personal diet. Do you have a specific diet that you follow, and uh, if then which one? Um, I don't have a very specific diet. I'd say I am ninety percent paleo, um, at least paleo Monday to Friday, more or less. Plus, I do drink some dairy and I eat some white rice. So, mostly paleo during the week. The weekend, if I'm eating out, I'll, I'll eat what I want. I won't worry too much if I'm with friends going out for dinner, for example. I won't stress about that. And I eat a lot of cricket protein. Uh, yeah, makes sense. And I, I also, I think I, I heard a soundbite where you, you mentioned that you're also into bulletproof coffee, which is, you know, one, one of the things... Oh. We made yeah. it, I think, popular here in Germany. Totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I usually work out in the mornings four or five times a week. If I don't work out in the morning, I'll have Bulletproof coffee when I wake up. But if I'm working out at 6, 7 a.m., then I don't want to do Bulletproof. Speaking of mornings, what is your uh, morning routine? Yeah, so I will wake up 6.45 or 7 a.m., And I will try to meditate for 10 minutes. Um, then I will try and crush like half an hour's work with a cup of tea. And then I go and do CrossFit after that. Come back from CrossFit, have a proper breakfast. Usually that's three, four eggs, some vegetables, and then come into the office. All right, so you're really into CrossFit still? I, I am right now, yeah. Do you, do, a right now. do you have ambitions in that field? Do you, do you compete as well? No, I don't. I mean, I'm not... I don't have enough time to, to devote to it to make myself competitive. You know, I, I probably go four times a week. If I, I was going to be competitive, I'd be having to go multiple times a day, most likely. Um, right, okay. I mean, the, ma the main reason I do CrossFit right now is because it's... You know, I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think about my workouts. I just show up there, 7 or 8 a.m. They tell me what to do. I do it. And then I can focus on my business. Whereas previously with powerlifting, I'd have to do all the programming and think about it a lot. And it was another thing just to get distracted by. This just enables me to focus on everything else. All right. Uh, so we have a little bit of an idea of... Uh, <laughs> what you do so your your principal focus is pretty much the growing the business right now and uh yeah this I guess exactly it does take a, a, a lot it's, of time it does yeah um how, well let's say how was the transition for you this is also a personal interest of mine but um from being a small creative startup with greg to now being a, a business uh what are the major things that have changed And for you, and how would you say what what is good about it and what is not so good about it? Honestly, I'd say we're still in that very small creative stage. You know, we are oh, okay. We're we're still you know we're only five six people full time, few people part time, and it's still That's myself true. and Greg running the company. So it's it's you know it's not as if we're a fifty person company with investors breathing down our necks and telling us what to do and hiring and firing every day. It's very much a small, tight team. Um, we're hiring a few more people this month, so we'll see how that affects things. But so far, it's, it's the same as it's always been. And we're, we're fortunate that our investors are not the kind of investors that tell you what to do and boss you around when they trust us to run the company at least so far until we screw up so <laughs> it's um no, it's been fantastic so far i'm having a great time how involved is someone like tim ferris in the business like how often does he approach you or talk to you about it i mean generally investors or advisors are as involved as you want them to be um okay. tim's obviously very busy but he's always available by phone by text if we want him for for whatever we might want him for and you know we'll do calls every couple of weeks, meet in person when he's in New York, when we're in San Francisco. And, you know, he wants the business to succeed. So it's in his interest to, to help us. And it's the same with all of our investors and advisors. All of our interests are very much aligned. 
if you could go back would you also would you do the the whole kickstarter thing again was that a good thing was it a good experience i'd say for us yes i wouldn't recommend every small food company does a kickstarter i'd say if your goal is to make hundred thousand dollars make fifty thousand dollars whatever it is to get your first run of manufacturing kickstarter is probably not the easiest way to get that money it's a lot of planning to do a good kickstarter a lot of time and so there are other there are other ways that you can find hundred thousand dollars that are easier than doing a kickstarter our goal though wasn't to make the money our goal was to generate press and publicity and buzz and get the idea out there And I think Kickstarter is one of the best ways to get an idea out there. Um, so for us, I'd 100% do it again, but I wouldn't say it's right for every company. Ah, okay, interesting. Uh, using it as a marketing tool more than an investment. Totally, and that's what most companies are doing now. Um, you know, it may, it may ultimately be the death of Kickstarter, but now you're seeing large companies with venture capital money doing very well, well-made videos that probably cost them $10,000, $20,000. And they're doing Kickstarter just as a, as a PR strategy. And so that, that's becoming very common now. Oh, okay. So this you would do 100% again. What if, if you would go back now and uh, meet yourself, let's say in the beginning stages, what is one advice? If you could give yourself one advice, what would that be? Um, I would tell myself, God, there, there are a lot of things I would tell myself to ignore almost everything because you get very distracted by the, the little things that come up all day, every day. Um, and so it's very easy to just be in that kind of auto responding mode of doing nothing, but answering your emails. And then at the end of the day, you've actually got nothing done. So now, you know, I'll carve out a few hours of my day where I just get shit done. And I don't look at my emails. I don't take calls. I don't take meetings. And that's very important. In the early days when you're, you know, you're cold emailing investors and all that kind of stuff, it's easy just to like go down that tunnel of not actually doing any real work. Mm. So that's a big thing. And then somewhat related, I mean, you know, things always go wrong when you're starting a company. And it always feels like it's the end of the world. And it never is. So, you know, you have a problem with your packaging, you're out of stock, or an investor turns you down, or a retailer has a problem with the out of, you know, the best buy date on your packaging and they want to kick you out, or whatever it is. Like, these things go wrong for every single company, and it always feels like it's the end of the <laughs> world. It's a disaster. And, you know, two days later, it's always fine. So, it took me a while to realize that and not to let that stretch me out. So I, I would tell my former self that it will be okay in a few days' time and not to worry about these little things and they happen to everyone. I can so relate to that right now because we are actually right now in the process. We just launched our, our own pro products with our brand Flowgrade and we were exactly a couple of the things that you mentioned happened to us, which was we were out of stock. We had problems with the packaging customers the, the the post office was on strike actually this was one reason why one of the packages we ordered from you guys was sent back wow. uh, and uh like all kinds of things happened and then you think it's the end of the world but yeah you're right it's it, it it's just not you, um, yeah and it's a balance right because you want to be relaxed about it but at the same time that stress and that frustration is what causes you to keep on running your business well so you've got to be a little like you've got to take it a little bit and let that drive you and have a little bit of frustration and, you know, want to solve the problems because that's what being an entrepreneur is, but not let it get you too deeply. Yeah. So that's a balance to strike for sure. I think so too. Sometimes it helps to be a little paranoid, uh, right. to drive you forward. Okay. To, to, I don't want to steal that much more of your time, but I have a couple more quick questions. Please. Rapid fire questions. Uh, so, um, what is something that Gabby Lewis does uh, when, you, when he's in doubt uh, or feeling self-conscious? What do you do for in inspiration? Uh, I go for a bike ride. Like a long bike ride? Like, uh, you know, yeah, like a long bike ride. So, when I was younger, I used to be really into mountain biking and cycling in general. And I'd go on tons of trips with my friends. We'd cycle for weeks, camp out there, and then... 
stopped doing that when I came to college. But whenever I'm just like not good, not being productive, not getting anything done, I'll take my bike and I'll just like cycle and cycle and cycle. And inevitably, when I, when I'm done, like everything will be so much more calm. Head will be clear. Very cool. That's it. Okay, next question. What what is one of the last experiments that you've done in, let's say, in the nutrition or fitness space? Because there's so many health fads right now. And yeah, is there something cool that you've done and tried? Um, let me think. I mean, you know, I started, so I was traveling a couple of weeks ago and it was hard for me to eat healthily. And, you know, the first day of being away, I ate terrible food and didn't feel that great. And I wanted to know whether it was kind of in my mind because I was like stressing out because I wasn't getting the nutrition I needed or whether it was actually making me feel physically bad. And so I thought, like, let me just give in to this for, like, four days of traveling and just eat, you know, whatever, whatever's there, not stress about it, and, like, try and really see if it affects me okay. and just, like, give in to it um, or whether it's just all in my head. And What it happened? was real. It was real. I did feel awful. <laughs> and so when I got back, I started, I got back on the wagon immediately. Oh, that's the best experiment. And then you know that yeah. you're, you're doing the right thing. I, yeah. Traveling is really hard, actually. Yeah. I asked Dave Asprey what he does, and he says, you know, just take a stick of butter and order vegetables. And then, but sometimes it's really tough to do. Uh, okay. And the last question, and I think this is a question I'm going to ask every Scotsman from now on. Is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you walk into a bar. What do you order? Um, whiskey. Neat. Lagavulin, if they have it. Love it. <laughs> That's what uh, I think. It's a good response for a Scotsman. Do you have any? <laughs> uh, I love old-fashioned as a uh, personal preference. Um, oh, yeah. But that usually, ha you have that with, uh, that's usually not scotch, right? You it's like bourbon or rye, rye, typically. Bourbon, rye, yeah. All right. Hey, Gabby, thank you so much for being yeah. on our Flow Grade show. It was a lot of fun. Uh, hope Thanks to for having me here again at some point. Definitely. And uh, we'll keep you posted definitely on, on how the, the extra protein bars are being received here by our Fantastic. people. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for having me again. Thank you. Have a good day over Take there. Take care. Bye. Now, this is the end of another episode of the Flowgrade Show. Thank you very much for listening. And if you like this episode, then make sure to like us on Facebook and to subscribe to this podcast. I'll see you next time. Bye.